Hello there. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Trevor Knight. And I'm Melinda May. And this is Stronger Voices. And in this podcast, we talk about music, faith, personal development, difficult questions, uh, random musings, and other things we like. And we hope you like too. So thank you for joining us. Um, I know there's a lot of things you could be doing, but I feel very confident that you're going to enjoy this conversation and get something useful and interesting and uplifting out of it. So again, thank you for tuning in and we hope you enjoy. Thanks for listening. Are you a New Year's resolution person? Do you do that? Uh, I'm a resolution person. So Yes, great answer. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if it's New Year's. If I want to do something, I'll... I'll think to myself, this is what I want to do in this next chapter. I, I need that thinking and I go through yeah. waves of it. You know, I said this on one of our podcasts. I don't know if it was the second one or the third one, but I said, I'm not in a season right now of general upkeep of my life. Cause you were talking about, um, breaking bad habits and like wanting to mm, make good right. habits. And I was like, I don't know. Cause I'm not there. I spent a lot of time building a framework and it's built and it's running. And now I'm just sort of being creative inside of it. And it's time for framework upkeep again. That's how this works. And now, uh, you know, now I'm back to how do I want to structure my life and what do I want to do here? There's so many little things that it, it, since it's the beginning of something, it's arbitrary that it's a year, I guess. But since it's the beginning of something, it's helpful that it's like, this is the beginning. This is the end of it. These are the projects I want to do in that time. So there's a couple things that I want to do. Like what? Well, uh, wait in 2020 or just like habit wise. (laughs) You can answer the question as you see fit. (laughs) Um, so my older mate Tori moved out and Madison moved in and since then like I've been way lax on dishes <laughs> <laughs> this is important stuff folks <laughs> you Buckle asked Trev no I, I did I did I did and so no dishes 2020 is hashtag no dishes 2020. oh you don't have a dishwasher <laughs> no it's tough yeah and so I definitely so that has because when Madison moved in she, she's is she good at dishes or bad no, she's she's amazing at everything. She's so like easy breezy with Tori. And Tori is amazing. And I just talked to her yesterday and she's a close friend and will be forever. But I was way more careful with Tori. And with Madison, I'm like, Madison's good. These dishes will be fine for tomorrow. But so, and plus there's a few other things that influence that. I was thinking that if I didn't keep everything perfectly in order all the time, it, I, it I had this thing in my head, the way you do anything is the way you do everything, which is a little bit true, but also kind of when I, I asked you this and it had a profound effect on me. I said, Trevor, when do you do your chores? And you literally said, you're like, what do you mean? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, you know, like your chores and stuff. And so I like, I had had a a profound effect on you. I thought you were going to say something way more meaningful that I said during the podcast. No, it was a pendulum swing of everything needs to be in order all the time, or this will be a symptom Mm. that Mm. if everything isn't in order, then nothing's in order kind of black and white thinking. And I had also like read a few things about that. And then I kind of was like, no, this is ridiculous. Like, this is fine. Like my life is like my apartment's fine. It's fine. Yeah. So um so, anyway so no dishes 2020 hashtag no dishes 2020 yeah that's a small one but there's obviously you know me <laughs> there's a lot going <laughs> there's on there's a lot of things <laughs> that's the safest one i can tell you yeah. the i guess the most serious one is um you know i can't focus i can't possibly focus on everything that i want to focus on so it's just literally like I can't physically do it. And so I want to, in 2020, um, reprioritize and mm. make the right things. The, everything can't be a priority. It's not going to work. So I need to have a way better ranking system of what I'm prioritizing. Yeah. Cause that's how I was sort of operating subconsciously, not knowing it, but everything is a priority and mm. it won't work. So yeah. that's another thing I've been kicking around yeah what's going on with you um it sounds like you approach the resolution thing similar to how i do it like i like new year's and the whole like new year's resolution idea to the extent that it's it's a good like 
check-in point. You know, everybody has some sort of check-in they do at the start of a new year, right? Because they're kind of forced to calendar-wise. But I think it's really dumb that people just like wait around for, you know, January, oh, January 1st, I'll start this thing. And that's why like January 1st, I will not go to the gym because it's going to be a mess. And then January 7th, smooth sailing. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> will be there. But the, I don't know, like at some point someone had to decide or probably a council of people like, okay, the calendar is going to work like this. Okay. This is going to be the start of the year. This is going to be the end of the year. It has nothing to do with like the seasons it happens in the middle of winter it has nothing to do with like the celestial calendar it's just like this arbitrary human thing so to like format how you want to plan your life based on like what year it is i i don't think that's doesn't make smart or prudent yeah so like i'm very much the same way if something i think needs to be done make that a resolution for today onward not like okay on march 1st uh, onward i'll do this one thing it's like if possible, just like make it a whatever April 9th thing onward, you know, just like do it whatever day it is forward. So like I like the idea of having some sort of collective like check in, like people reevaluate their lives. People like look at what they're doing and their goals and where they've been and where they want to go. Good. It's great for that. Um, when you start to use it as a crutch and like I'm going to start doing these 20 things in in January and you have done none of those things in 2019 you dig yourself a hole and you set yourself up for disappointment I think definitely I think if you spread those things out and one of those ideas comes to you in October and one of them comes to you in March it's much easier to like plan those things as they come up rather than in 2020 my life's going to change and all these dramatic things are going to happen, you know? Absolutely. I I do think though, something I learned from our friend, Tim Ferriss, I love to conceptualize your friend. Dear friend. <laughs> I love to conceptualize my life in projects and experiments. So did I share this with you before? Mm, I don't it think sounds so. familiar. Okay. It sounds familiar. So two week projects, or, I'm sorry, two week experiments, and if they work, they turn into two six month projects. That's so intriguing. Well, it may not always be two weeks and six months, but my point is, I like starting line, finish line. I really like it. Even when, even when we were talking about doing this podcast, I said, let's do it in seasons. Like let's do. 20 episode seasons and you said why and I and I couldn't come up with a great answer I ask that question a lot and sometimes maybe it's not the right question sometimes I feel like you know I'm gonna ask it and it let in you're like oh I knew you were gonna ask that. no I <laughs> Trevor I ask that a lot I'm sorry I love that you ask me why I told you this before about you that is something that I find like life-giving because I have all these nebulous ideas and I love when someone's like okay but what <laughs> and why and when and how it makes me feel good so uh so yeah, you should keep asking those questions. Even if I can't come up with the answer, at least somebody's like, hey, you should come up with this answer. <laughs> but uh, so I like having a, a, a starting line and a finish line. That helps me to achieve a goal. Even I'm in talks about booking a residency somewhere. And I even thought to myself, I thought, hmm, should there be, should I ask them to do it for six months? Because mm. residencies are typically like, you're just going to do it until it yeah. doesn't. It's typically sure. not. It doesn't have an end date. It has a start date. Yeah. Just to conceptualize in my own head. So my whole point of that is there is something valuable about the start of anything. It's like, well, here's your starting sure. line. But, um, and also something I love to do at the end of every year and the beginning of a new one, me, Erica and I do this thing, recap everything. Where were you a year ago? Where do you want to go? It's this big, long, fun conversation. Um, and we do it every year. What was the best part? What was the worst part? And it's, it's, that's handy too, just to have a moment sure. of punctuation. So yeah. What was the best part of your year and worst part of your year? Let's do this. Oh, oh, Come oh on. man. <laughs> man. 2019. My life has changed a lot in 2019. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I mean, highlights 
you know, include, you know, my brother getting married. I got to say a best man speech That's and sing big. a song at his wedding, you know, monumentous Wait, occasion. What song did you sing at the wedding? Um, I sang this song called When I Say I Do. It's like a wedding song that I had never heard before and they requested. Cool. Um, but it was fun. I mean, that's a huge, you know, family moment. Um, you know, other huge things, you know, I switched industries, obviously, from finance trev to whatever I am now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and that was great. You know, I got to release my first original music. I got to perform my first live shows. 2019 was huge for it you. It was a big year. It was a big year. Um, I recorded a lot of stuff that's coming out in 2020. Um, started this podcast. Um figured out kind of like who I was as an artist and what I want to portray as a brand and the, the image and the messages I want to convey. And, um, I think we talked about this in one of our previous podcasts, but like it was a great like exploratory year for me to like figure out what and who I am and like what I want to do and where I want that to go. And I think 2020 is going to be a great year to just dig my heels into that and see where it goes and to just grow and, change and improve all the things that I've been building over 2019. So there weren't a lot of, I don't know. I want to say it was a pretty well speckled year in terms of peaks and valleys. There wasn't like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, when did you leave your job? I left my job on May 10th, hmm. which was a Friday. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it has been very interesting for me to conceptualize that because I know exactly what I was doing in January of 2019 mm. because it was truly uh, a new beginning in many different ways. And I know the headspace that I was in, like it's just and during that time you were still a finance trev. Yes. Mm. Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So for, yeah, most of the first half of the year. Yeah. And, you know, like. For a lot of 2019, you know, January, February, March, I knew I was going to make some sort of big change like this. I didn't wow. know what the final date was going to be because there were a lot of moving pieces there. And, you know, I was working for a big corporation and sometimes those decisions aren't always up to you on when, when and how you want to do those things. Um, so I wasn't sure what the date was going to be, whether it was going to be April or August or sometime I knew in the meat of the year I was going to have a big change. So in, you know, January, February, March, I... You know, I got some equipment. I started writing a lot more music. I started playing open mics all the time. And in 2018, I played zero open mics. And so, like, January, February, March, April, I played a ton of open mics and just, like, started to get comfortable, like, seeing the physical manifestation of, like, what the life I was going to be transferring to was going to be like. Wow. Um, and that was exhausting for, like, whatever, five months when I was doing that, you know, at night while working, you know, 12 hours a day. Um but it gave me a great platform to like jump off and figure out, okay, right now I don't have time to do these things. When I do have time to do it, here's what I'm going to focus on. Here's what I know I can do. Here's what I need to improve on. Things like that. So yeah, it, it's been a great year. It's been a very formative year. I'm excited to see where the, where the next one takes me. Mm -hmm. Like if there's any, if the change in 2020 and improvement is in 2020 is a fraction of what it was in 2019, I'll be very happy. I always forget this about your life. And every time I remember, I'm like re like, it's just the, I just think it's so neat that you did this. <laughs> so you were, you lived your, you worked in finance, then you really did it. You're like, I'm going to do the thing I want to do and go do it. And I just think that that's, and for anybody who doesn't know, maybe people don't know that are listening, but yeah, I, you had like a full-time job. You worked, did you work on wall street? I did. Yeah, you worked on Wall Street as like a trader. If you've ever seen Wolf of Wall Street, it was just like that. No. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> no. Did I work as a trader? Yes. Um, That's what I picture. <laughs> but no, it was not, you know, exactly like that. <laughs> I'm laughing at myself. Crack myself um, up. All right, fine. It wasn't exactly like that. But some stuff, some stuff was really cool. Like some stuff you know, was like what you'd see in the movies. You know, I worked on a trading floor that was a couple football fields big with probably a thousand people on it. I had like eight screens in front of me. I was like answering probably a hundred phones a day. So it was like very active, fun, like dynamic, high energy, you know, for some people, high stress work environment. Um, I mean, I've been blessed and I think you've been blessed too to be a person that can like handle that pretty well and like keep a pretty 
level head um, during those types of situations. So, yeah, I there were a lot of things about it I really liked. Um, but, yeah, I did used to do those things. Yeah, and then May 10th was your last day. Yep. And you said, I'm leaving this whole finance thing. That, by the way, you got, obviously, a degree in that. From well, I got a degree in economics and political science. So, like, the school I went to, they didn't have a business program. They didn't have a finance program. It's like a liberal arts education. So the closest thing to that was economics. So like a lot of people who major in economics go into finance. Or if you want to go into finance, you major in economics. At Dartmouth? Yeah. And then you get this job in New York and you work this job in New York as a trader, as a... Sorry, what was your... It's it, Was that your title, trader? Yeah, well, I was an analyst. For the first two years in a lot of those places, they, like, first two years, you're an analyst. Yeah. That's like your title. You're doing your Wolf of Wall Street thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't call it that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <clears throat> and you decide, I really want to do, I really want to be a musician. You pray about it a ton and then decide this is the path you're going to take. May 10th is your last day. So May 10th was a Friday, 11th, 12th. What was May 13th like? Do you remember May 13th, that Monday? You wake up, you don't have to be at work. Yeah, no, and I had been planning for that for a long time. Um, yeah, that week I I had already bought like, you know, a schedule and I had like filled it out. I was like, here's what I'm going to do every like half hour for, you know, and after I wake up. So yeah, the first day I woke up and I was used to getting up really early, right? And so, and I knew if I was going to do something like this, I did not want to like reward myself with some sort of like vacation where I was like, Oh, I like, let me get to this when I get to it and the things will fall into place. So I like, I wanted to treat it as legitimately as possible and treat it like a business, which is, which is what it is. You know I mean? You have all the same pieces of any entrepreneurial venture. You're like, starting a business. Exactly. You have research and development, which is your writing and editing of songs. You have, your marketing, which is your social media and your promo, which takes, again, that's something I had to learn those first few months. It takes way more time than I <laughs> had hoped or mm -hmm. anticipated. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you have operations and sales and all sorts of things like you would have if you started a coffee shop, you know? So I wanted to treat it like that. So I woke up at a, you know, a good hour, like seven, seven thirty. I went on a walk. I read the word. I prayed. And then I, you know, I started my day. I had for the first while, Every day I had like this three to five, I would do my writing stuff and I would come up with new stuff. I would edit old stuff. But like um, in the morning at like 11, I would warm up and practice all my stuff um, at, I could probably go back and look at, I finished that journal, um, but I could probably go back and look at what my schedules were like. But I, you know, I had this goal, like I need to send this many emails. Like I didn't. And then the night before I would plan, okay, here's the people I need to reach out to tomorrow. Here's how many times I want to post on social media this week. Here's, you know, what the preview is going to look like once I post the photo and the grid changes and all that stuff. So I, I tried to approach it as analytically as possible. And another reason why I'm super thankful for the job that I did have. Well, one, obviously it afforded me the opportunity to do this, right? Not many people get that opportunity where you can switch and for however long I get to do this full force, put all my time and energy into this. So incredibly grateful for that. But I was in this environment where everything was procedural. You know, everything I was doing was, you know, documented, instructed. It was concrete, quantitative, analytical stuff. Yeah. So it put me in a great position and one that I think not a lot of musicians are and that I can look at this objectively as, you know, a plan as like a series of data points and say, here's what I need to do. Here's the best way to execute that. Here's how I can do it by accenting my strengths, using the resources I have, you know, in a way that I could pursue it and not just like let it happen to me, you know? Um, that's really well said in a way that you can pursue it and not just let it happen to you, but it is a balance. But yes, 100%. Also, you have a great skill for being able to remove yourself from your business. You can see yourself as the product and not just the artist, which is hard sometimes. It is hard. No, it's and, really and hard. 
and even it, your it is, songs. It is difficult, like, but it is something that can be practiced. I think. I mean, it started out very uncomfortable. You know, I didn't have an Instagram before I wanted to start doing music stuff, so I created that. Like, if you go way back, you can probably find like my first posts are like about that. You know, it's like, oh, okay, this is like a music thing, and you know, all, like the majority of all the people that started following me right away were my close personal friends, which is great because. You know, they're the people that are going to be interested anyway. Um, but yeah, that is something I had to learn and practice. You know, I didn't like if you're promoting again, if you started a coffee shop, it's a lot easier to go put out advertisements in like print, like social media, whatever. Come to my coffee shop, come to my coffee shop. But when it's you, when it's like, here, look at me here, listen to my stuff here, come to my show. It feels different. It feels way different because when people respond to it however they do, they're not just responding to your, whatever you're selling, they're responding to you, you know, as a person, which can be, yeah, it, it is difficult to remove yourself from everything like that and recognize that in this instance, you're the product, but it is something that can be learned and it's pretty necessary, I think. It's really necessary. And you also have a, um, you can also separate, because this is something that I, um, saw in you and I recognized as something that I kind of don't do which may be good but good for me to start doing um, you can separate your songs from yourself quite easily and so, yeah <laughs> I can't I yeah. can't and again I when I started writing songs you know not that long ago I kind of thought that's how most people did it you know like that is how most people do it I think. But not Melinda May, right? Every Melinda May song is a true story, right? I think you told me that once. Well, I wasn't going to tell you guys that. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's out. It's out. Yeah, that's true. And th- and yes, every Melinda May song is is true. But here's the thing that I try to explain about this. It may just be a fleeting thing that sure. I felt for like a second sure. that I was like, ooh, let me explore. So that's why this show on January, that I'm playing January 7th, is called the Off the Record Show. And I'm playing so many songs that I've been afraid to play before because I'm aware that I've, I'm very much, the way that I talk about my songs, I say, this is a true thing that happened to me. This is something I deeply believe in. This mm. is, this isn't, there's an overall big picture here that I think is true about life. Sure. But there are so many songs that I write that are just kind of silly, goofy, or a moment of I'm not married to this as a part of my value set. Sure. And those are very difficult for me, but they exist because I wrote them. Sure. But I'm always like, someone's going to take this yeah. the wrong way. You know? No, but I, I don't know. Like you see that as a strength of mine that I can separate myself from my songs. I see it as strength of yours oh, that God. you can just, you know, transform your experiences into a song. Cause that'd be harder for me. If someone were to tell me mm. right about this time in high school, when you failed, it'd be like, it'd kind of be tough to make that happen. Hmm. So like when I, started writing songs and I approached it like I, you know, had been trained to do in my job uh, as a project, as an analytical piece of something I had to complete. You know, I could think about it in terms of structure, in terms of sound, in terms of form, and, you know, slowly put the pieces together. Um, and there are, and, you know, along the way, you you tack on and you invest your emotions and stuff like that into it. I was going to say, I don't... I don't fully believe that you are detached from your... No, no, no. And I don't I think mean, you're saying you're and detached. And I don't think... But. With the exception of people who just write songs for a living, and there are some people that do, I think every song is a little bit of both. It's a little bit of, yeah, this this happened to me and it's true, but how do I make this sound good to the listener, mm-hmm. you know? And it's even if you're, you start out with, oh, this chord progression sounds nice, what's a good melody on top of it, which is how I write a lot of my songs you still do have to put yourself in a place that you identify with the protagonist of the song and think about how the message will translate. So I do think it's a little bit of both every time. The past couple of years, I've really been more open to, but it's hard to this day. I'll think to myself, this rhymes, this fits with this theme, but it that it didn't happen just that way. Mm. And I'm lying if I write it this way, ah. you know? See, I don't think like that. I know. And I think that that's right. I think that your way is right. I don't think I there's, think a, I don't think there's a, right yeah, I don't think there's a wrong. Yeah. But I, I think it's a good, 
method of songwriting to be able to, cause you could do anything, but I've, I've been so impassioned to tell the truth about things mm. that I'm, I'm very, I want to tell the story re- as it happened. Sure. But like I said, in the past couple, the past like three years, I've been more open to, I could just write stuff. Sure. So, um, yeah, see, and, and I think that's a strength. I think that's a huge advantage. You know, I think that's what makes you follow along with an artist and join their journey and listen to their stuff is when you connect to it, you know? Yeah. And yeah, and I think if you're speaking from a place where it means something to you, and I think you can make a song mean something to you even if the experiences in the song didn't happen to you. But I think when an audience member or a listener can feel that it means something to you that has a profound effect that that makes a huge difference you know yeah i i yeah cuz we we all work with what we're given sure so this is this is what god gave me this and i'm not saying i can't grow obviously or shouldn't grow but that's genuinely the way I process things. So my, sure. my art comes out of that. And the same is true for you. So I agree. I think both have their have their um, strengths and good things about sure. them. But it is cool to work with someone who has a different strength than you because you can sit, you can see it sure. and say, oh, I need a li- I need, mm. I want some of that. Sure. And you could practice it. So. And you can still, <clears throat> again, exactly like you said, like you can still even if you start writing the song with the music like I often do, that's kind of how we started writing the song we wrote together, Not Anymore. You know, like we didn't have this concept and we're, and we're like, this happened to us, this happened to me, we need to write a song about it. It As we started to put the song together, it came we together. asked questions like, what would be a more meaningful line here? Or like, how would this echo or negate what we already said earlier in the song? Mm-hmm. So you can still even though you approach it more formulaically and more like a problem to be solved, you can still make it incredibly meaningful. And I, and again, most of the songs you hear on the radio or on Spotify or wherever that you really identify with were written by somebody else, you know, that, but the artist and the songwriter, you know, you, you still have to put yourself in a place where you can connect with it and you can make it mean something because people can hear that. I think people do recognize that when it happens. I know that I do. I know that all of my favorite songs are come from some place of truth. And I feel, and I think that's why I've been so passionate about this. You know, John Mayer's songs really like his lyrics, like hit me when I was 14 and stuck with me. And he's one of my like top songwriters. And I felt that his uh, lyrics are true. And they certain I don't know about now with his newer music, but I think they are. But certainly like Room for Squares and his earlier albums, you can tell the, w- the way they, those songs are written. They're true. And so I, I always wanted to do that. So that's how I've just been like shaped as an artist as well. Yeah. To tell the truth. And there's so there's so many messages I'm passionate about, like good thing we never made out. You know, there's a whole thing there that I'm passionate about. It's a, it's kind of a silly song, but that really happened. And soup, that that story in the first verse and second verse, like that is how it happened. And um, yes, yes, which I wrote kind of recently there's some stuff in there that hasn't happened but that came from a very real dream like you know so to speak so um but yeah it's all it's all true uh yeah but I'm trying more I've really opened my mind up um in the past two years and trying to write more of whatever not being so okay for example um you picked the girl with the tattoo that I was writing about uh, some of that stuff didn't happen, but exactly like that. But in the song I'm saying, like I can picture it happening this yeah. way. Sure. So yeah, you can go a lot of places with it. Sure. But I still think that. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I would venture to say it's not about writing something that's true or something that's not true or writing something that 
you've experienced versus something you're totally detached from because you have to do both, you know, like, I don't know, like this, like the song I wrote called On My Way Home, right? Like I've felt those feelings before. Have I had exactly the experience, like I say in the song where like whatever, I'm at a party and like I was like sleepless the night before, like whatever. Did that exact thing happen to me? Probably not. But like that is a true story. You know, like that does happen. Mm -hmm. Like that does happen to people. Mm -hmm. And like at different points in the song, when you're writing something like that, even when it's not, you know, an autobiography, exactly like cut and paste from but a point you, of your you life you took into it from a real place sure you yeah. have to you, you have, have to. to like once you start that's what i was trying to express yeah once you start mm. writing a song even if it you start with the melody and you think the melody sounds fun so you put a fun concept on top of it you still have to put yourself in a place as like okay what do I think is fun? When have I been in this mood and what was I feeling during that time? What words come to mind? What moods Or else come it's a mind? bad song. Yeah. It's a bad... All art is like that. Th- that's what I think. That's the reason why people like art. It's the reason why, for whatever reason, going back, I- even in the history of humanity, there's art on caves. People like it. They draw. Mm. And part of it is... We just want to see for it's a very human thing. Um, and even be, the existence of parables and stories and songs and art, why that's also imp- so important is because we like something true depicted in in this in a way that can't be expressed otherwise. So there's a certain truth in, I think, paintings, a good painting or a song or um, a story that it's it's a parable style or like it's archetypical. Like there's some kind of true thing in there that would be, it would take me pages and pages. It would, it's a 20 page essay to like explain all of that, but there's something, but the simplicity of it in two verses of bridge and a chorus, there's a truth there that speaks sure. to people. And that's why people like paintings too. Cause when you, when you see a painting that really strikes you, it's because it's like, Oh, there's something in there that's inside of me that's being expressed tangibly in the painting, (laughs) you know, and songs do that too. Um, Yeah. So it has to be, if it's good art, it comes from some truth and it might not be your truth. It might not be something that actually happened, but it's something that's true for humans or, you know, on some kind of deeper level. But so that begs a question, Um, knowing that, you know, the majority of, most the majority of each one of your songs Mm -hmm. is a true story i've also heard you say like you would love to get into writing songs for other people and you'd love to sell some of your songs or explore that avenue whatever it may entail how do you envision doing that do you think that would be difficult if someone came to you and was like i need a breakup song and you're like here this happened to me or would you write something new or if they were like can you write a song about you know this person having this experience, do you think that would be difficult if you had never done it? So do I think, so there's, I think that whatever, there's nothing that I go through that is not common to everyone. There's no, and I think we've discussed this before, whatever it is you're going through, it's a, it's not a Trevor thing or a Melinda thing. It's a thing that everybody goes through guaranteed at its core it's and it could probably be reduced to um rejection or insecurity or falling in love or a million other things that i can't even name so i think writing songs for other people would entail i would want the artist to be impassioned about a message. I wouldn't want them to say, I mean, they could, and this would be a fun exercise. And I did it on the Jimmy Fallon show, right? They were like, (laughs) write about texting your dentist. Cool. I've never texted my dentist, but I think it came out like a cute little song. So that's fine. But the dream is that someone's like, I need you to help me tell my story. And I'm going to be like, tell me your story. And we'll stay up all night with like, you know, just, and it'll be this, like very real thing. And I will understand that and their pain and their struggle or maybe they, or their joy or their victory or their whatever that is. And then I, with the 
with God's help and the tools and gifts that God has given me can craft that into here's how to tell the truth. The very complex took eight hours to, to tell the whole story truth. And here's how we can get it into a three minute piece of art. That's going to, that's going to say, that's going to get the truth of the situation out of you. (laughs) And that's a tall order, but with God's help, it can be done. That's what I want to do. So that's my idea. And, I'll understand it and I'll know it and I'll have been there too. And Mm. I'll be on that person's team and I'll be like, Ooh, we're going to tell your story, (laughs) you know, like, let's get this out there. So that's what I, that's how I see it going down. But yeah. 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 That's interesting. Cause I think that would be really fun. Like it'd be cool to be, like you said, on somebody's team like that. I do think a lot of times, especially in pop music. Um, nowadays, it's done almost the opposite. I think it, I think it's done as like the hardo analytical part of Trev, like to the max. It's literally 10 people sit in a room and like every one of like Ariana Grande's songs, you look at it and the lyrics are, you I know, two it. paragraphs long mm-hmm. and it's written by like 10 people. I have seen that. So you, you, you have these people who like just sit in a room and their job is just churn out songs. They just churn out songs. And if you have like a publishing deal and your job is to write, you know, 15 to 20 songs a year, you just like churn them out. So I think it can probably be, I mean, again, I, it's not a, an area that I'm extremely knowledgeable about, but I'm sure it's done on a huge spectrum of those ways. Like you either just like, you know, no feeling like churn them out or like you said, you're like on somebody's team and you're like portraying their message um, in a way that people can listen to and digest and understand. Yeah. And it depends what the objective is. I'm down to try anything and I, Mm. I'm confident that whatever, and this goes back to whatever the thing is that God puts in front of me to do, I will, I will, do it to the best I can and I'll use all of my resources and tools and things and, and try my hardest. But if the question on the table is how do you write for someone else? If that's not your story, I think the answer is to let it be like get on their team and let it be your story as a writer. If the objective on the table is you're going to write jingles like texting my dentist or something. Okay, let's try it out. But I think whatever what whatever the thing comes up to do that's what i'm going to do and if it follows any other pattern of anything else in my life it'll probably take a lot of work sure <laughs> but, but yeah so but i just love writing songs i mean it's so exciting you have to know this feeling i'm sure when you have an idea for something and it's it's all coming together and um it's just so neat yeah I had it is a, cool yeah so I had a really good writing session yesterday with myself and I got this idea for a really good song that I'm excited about that maybe I'll play January 7th yeah but um and it came out of nowhere I was writing a whole other song and I was working on a, a song that I've been working on for a while but then I got this idea and I just like ran with it and, yeah. a, and a lot of things came together and it's just it's creating stuff is wow yeah. Great. No, mm-hmm. yeah, the I know exactly the feeling you're talking about. The I know you do. the the feeling that something that's out there now, something that is a sonic product, something that exists, didn't exist before and I created it, you know? Mm-hmm. Like you can listen to either of our songs on whatever platform you want and it's so cool to hear like, yeah, you know that guitar riff? Like I wrote that. You hear that like piano part? I played that. Those backing vocals, I wrote those harmonies, you know? Like they didn't exist before yeah. you created them. It's something that isn't now in you know tangible history that you manifested you know Mm -hmm. out of the ether you like created it it's cool so the same itch that gets scratched when i think i have this like nebulous idea and someone is like okay but what why how i think the same and it feels good i think it's the same thing with songwriting i have this feeling it's nebulous i you know i don't know where it's going and then this three minute song it's so it feels good it's like oh this is that feeling that i couldn't name or couldn't put my finger on or i had something that i was passionate about that i couldn't express and i i captured it and now can share it with you right and especially if you're 
all creative people have this thing going on where they often struggle to really express themselves or constantly feel misunderstood. And that's kind of cliche. But for me, it's so true. (laughs) I always feel misunderstood and I always feel like it's difficult to express myself. So my songs are the way that I'm like, gotcha. Mm. This is it here. Know me. And that makes me feel not lonely, (laughs) Sure, (laughs) you know, among other things. But that's a part of one of the hundred reasons why it feels so good to capture that as you said something that you out of the ether and something nebulous and turn it into something tangible right this this thing that was like um just floating around and now it's not floating i've nailed it down yeah captured it and so yeah it's it's my favorite thing i think in the world is to write songs (laughs) To tell you the truth. Oh, that's good. Is that true? Yeah, it's pretty true. Hmm. So. So I have a follow up to that. So given that feeling that you get, mm-hmm. you know, when you've created something, and circling back on the writing for other people avenue, would you be hesitant to if you started writing for someone else to? give them a song you've already written about yourself. And if if not, if you're like, oh, sure, you can use that song, is there any song that you've written that you wouldn't give to someone else? That you're like, this is Melinda May's song. I don't care how famous you are. I don't care how much money you'll pay me. This is my song. Hmm. Let me genuinely explore the answer to this for a second. Um, not one. No. Not one. And because... So you're just in it for the money. <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> just no, it's because I'm just in it for the message. <laughs> That's truly it. Because I first of all, yeah, I am so passionate about the message of my songs that I don't care who sings them really. I would I want to sing them. I would love to do sure. that. I love performing, but there there's not that's my, yeah. But if there's someone who wants to sing any one of my songs, yes, because I'll write another one. <laughs> you know? So I don't have one song that I'm like, oh, this is my song. There are songs I feel particularly tied to, particularly close to. There are songs that I feel that, wow, this really is incredibly um, my it defines me in a way you know or something like that but but now anybody could sing any one of my songs and it would be such an amazing i would love that how about you um well just to echo what you said i i don't think even if someone else was singing it it would diminish the fact that it defines you you know just Mm. because someone else it might even augment it you know it might even say if someone else identifies with this enough to sing it themselves that makes the message i wrote even more powerful you know now it's not just me that believes this it's somebody else so yeah i i don't think i would have a problem with that either i wouldn't want to you know totally give them up to the point that i could never you know play them if i did my own show because you know i did write them but yeah no i agree i think if if it's something you're passionate about to the point that yeah, it defines you. Mm-hmm. I think that only I think that only becomes stronger when someone else sings it yeah. because now there's a second voice who understands that and wants to, you know. Yeah, my dream, 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 dream is I, and there's a lot that I have, but one of them is I really want to be in Target or somewhere and look around and nobody knows that they're listening to me (laughs) or my song or whatever. But as I'm looking around at these people who are, because music is incredibly influential. It just is. And it it can change a room or a mood. So this song is there and people don't even know it's me, you know? And whether it's I'm the writer of that song or the singer of that song, that would be the dream right there. So... Yeah, and also, 
yes to everything you said, it would only enhance it if someone else yeah. sings it. But also there are some songs that to me that are such a Melinda May voice. You know, like this is... Songs that you wrote? Yeah. Oh, okay. That I think to myself, I don't know if someone else... You know, I want to... I would love for all of my songs to be um, sold or out there or sung, sung by somebody else, but but I don't know if someone could sing You Picked the Girl with the Tattoo. <laughs> you know, could they? I don't know. Sure. You think? Yeah. Hmm. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are there are songs you probably strongly identify with that you didn't write. You know, like you stumble upon songs that you think, wow, I experienced something very similar to that. Or wow, like I believe with exactly what they're saying or I align with the message of this song. So mm-hmm. I think, yeah, I you never know who's going to, who that's going to strike for you. I think there are plenty of people who could, Align with that song. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I think you're right. I'm trying to remember the lyrics to that song. Of what? Tattoo. Um, one is like, you come home from work, you just want to relax, but I'm on some new kick. I want some feedback. I see it all play out from tonight until our last and I see me in your kitchen. I'm all dressed like a hipster. And you're wondering why I like to take walks at midnight. And I can't blame you. <laughs> just go, just go, just go. Just go with the girl with the tattoo. <laughs> so I think that's entirely identifiable with other people. Yes. Great. Oh, I'm reading the Bible. I'm blasting rap music. I know to you, I'm just hella confusing. <laughs> the hella confusing part, definitely. <laughs> you may have pushed off a few groups with the first part of that <laughs> phrase. <laughs> But that's For okay. Sure. No, yeah. but you you also listen to songs all the time, and I do too. That you love the song and you listen to it, and l- there are some lyrics you're just like, okay, whatever. Yeah, you know, <laughs> of course, you're like I'll accept this. Yeah, that <laughs> like yeah. I'll take that, you know, because it comes with the rest of the package. Yeah, and it's a good lyric, yeah. but it doesn't ex- sure. But every once, it doesn't mean you don't like the song. Yeah, but when you find that song where every lyric, you're like, yeah, sure, yes, sure, it's the best feeling. Sure, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So wait, how far are we in right now? Because we've talked about nothing that we said. We which were is fine. <laughs> which is fine. I think it's been a good I conversation. Think it's I don't know if I want to force anything on top of no. it. No. How many minutes are we at, Trev? Um, give or take high 40s. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we didn't start the podcast. <laughs> so welcome to the <laughs> Welcome to our podcast. I hope you've enjoyed okay, our so intro. I guess that's the podcast. Is it? I mean, well, we haven't done minutes. we haven't done our you know, the precedented end with a short, silly question. Oh, can we do that? Yeah. Do okay. you have one? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me think. <laughs> um, hmm. What is something that you did in 2019 that you absolutely will not do in 2020? That's a deep question, It Trev. is? Okay, yeah. I can think of a different one. But it's so good. <laughs> Should we talk about it? Hmm. Well, it's, I feel like it's kind of hard to air a question like that out there and not answer it. Mm. Why don't you try to answer it in a fun, short, silly way, if possible? Okay, I could do that. Something I did in 2019 <clears throat> that I absolutely will not do in 2020 is... I can do this. I can do this. What did I do in 2019? I did so many things for the first time that I will definitely be doing again. Rock climbing. So you did that for the first time in 2019? Sure did. Wow. Real fun. Uh, I learned how to like deadlift and squat and all of that. That will keep happening. What else did I do? I'm trying to think of like not intangibles. Tangibles. What did I actually do? I don't know. I feel like I'm wasting too much time. No, you're not. Okay. It's a pretty short answer so far. Um, That I won't be doing. I don't know. You answer first. Maybe it'll inspire me. No doubt it will. Um, man. <clears throat> um, well, 
in 2019, I took a, I took a seven month break from posting anything online, any shows, and I needed that. And yeah. that was right. And there's a lot of reasons why that happened, but that is not the plan for 2020. 2020. <laughs> That's Schedule just out not. Your seventh month break. Yeah, that is just not the plan at all. And it's not like I was, I mean, I was still in the recording studio. I was still writing, but I just needed to. It's a whole other podcast. Sure. Um. Yeah, I don't know. There are some things that you just like learn with time. Like when I released my first song, there was a lot of things I did for that that I probably won't ever do again. You know, I sent so many stupid pointless emails that like I... N you know, in hindsight, it was like those were so clearly like dead end waste of time type things to do. And like stuff on the promo front, stuff on producing content, like certain ways of recording videos, certain ways of writing songs. I know. And that I guess that's just gradual improvement over time. But like certain open mics, I know I won't go back to. There we go. Like little stuff things like that, like that mm, you know. Mm. I don't have a lot of those from 2019 because like I said, I took that seven month break. Yeah. And number two, you know, and there's always room for improvement, but as like a whole thing that I did that I won't do again, I don't know. There's probably things I do differently, of course, because you, you're always going to do things differently, but I don't know if there's something that I'm like, that was a waste that, or that w wasn't the right direction or wasn't the right way to go. Um, yeah, I'll definitely do more co-writing. Uh, I'll definitely do more acoustic shows. I did mm. none of those, I think, in 2019. Is that true? No, I did a bunch at the end of the year. But stuff like that. So yeah. th lots of changes for 2020. Yeah. Lots of changes. But my promo, th th there's so much, too, that I'm going to leave as a, you know, I don't want to put it all out there. No, no, exactly. We'll like see. I'm not we'll going to list every place I'm never going to go to again. And right. I'm not going to say, like, every person that I responded to their direct message that I'm never going to want to respond to again, you know, like all yeah. the random things that I know I won't do in 2020. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of those. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot of point in listing them all. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to ask you one silly question. Actually, I got one. Okay. What's the best thing you got for Christmas? Ooh. Or your oh, favorite man. thing you got for Christmas? Well, I actually got this sweater for Christmas. Thanks. <laughs> thanks grandma. Uh, Is that your, Oma? Uma? No, this is my dad's mom. Oh, what do you call she her? She goes by grandma. Grandma. Mm -hmm. Grandma, grandpa, and then Oma and Opa. Oma and Opa. What language is that? German. Oma. Mm. My Hebrew friends call their mom Uma. Or Ima? Ima. Ima. Yeah, I think in a lot of languages, it's very similar. Mm. Well, it's um, cute, whatever it is. It is. I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh my gosh, I wonder if my mom will be called Oma. Oma. Maybe. My sister's kids called their grandma this is so my parents this this will tell you ladies and gentlemen a lot about my family and how i was raised the kids started calling grandma papa because i don't know it just started and no one corrected them so for years it was papa and grandpa <laughs> what i'm oh i'm not kidding you and like there's a papa like that was grandma's name and wow. they were like this is fine and now I can't say I've heard that one. And I'm sure they would go to school and say like, Oh, grandpa and papa. And that, you know, so, uh, now Tegan, the oldest calls them Don and will, which are my parents' first names. Wow. Can't say I've ever done that. Even my own parents. Well, because she gets all confused cause I'm there and I, I say dad and, but, mom says grandpa and Tabitha calls my parents by their first names. Did I tell you that? You knew no. that. Yeah. She just calls them Don and Will. <laughs> I don't know. And so they get the kids hear all these names. And so I see Tegan struggling. She'll be like, uh, d d Will, Will, come here. And they just let it go. They're like, that's fine. So anyway, um, I don't know. Oh, because you were talking about your Oma and the sweater. That oh, she got yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> other things I got. I got a lot of good things and you know i we toned down as i think we've gotten older we've toned down gifts which i think is a great thing because you don't need a lot of stuff mm -mm. um in fact you know most of the year i'm actively trying to like get rid of things i don't need so um the only things that i always enjoy getting are things i know i'm going to use like i got a chipotle gift card 
already started using it. Like got a Trader Joe's gift card. I'll probably use it tonight. Yeah. So things like that, like Amazon gift card, I will use. So things like that, um, where they still show that like, okay, someone actually thought about what I use and mm-hmm. um, helped me do that. But it's also like very practical. I love those kind of things. So the best things I got this year were probably those. I got a couple like shirts like this that are like, you know, my style and I know I will wear. And then I got a bunch of gift cards to places I always go, which is like an incredibly successful Christmas. Yeah, definitely. What about you? Well, my family also is not, we, they're really big on gifts for the kids, but it's just me, my mom and my sister. So with each other, we're not, my sister has an incredibly generous heart. And so she always gets everybody things, but we're not a big, nobody really cares that much. You know, we want to get it. If something comes up, we'll get it for each other. But it's, it's typically like a smaller thing for the adults but my sister just asked me what I wanted and I said I wanted a blanket and so she got me one and it's a great blanket and I like it a lot so that was probably and I got that and a uber gift card fantastic you know which helps too because I want to take less ubers and so this will actually help with that because um now even when I'm I'll try again. It's like goes back to that thing of like having a, you can see when your balance is like depleting on it of having like a a starting line and a finish line. It's like, okay, I've got this 50 bucks. So I'll just like ration out or whatever. But anyway, so yeah, it was, it was a great Christmas. I don't really care about, you know, it was way more about, uh, all the games I played with my nieces and nephew. It was just so, so stupid and fun in the best way. Yeah. So that's what Christmas is about. Just spending time with, people we care about mm-hmm. that's what it should be about at least yeah yeah we wait, wait until brian has uh children it's gonna be really oh i can't wait yeah. uncle trev oh my god uncle trev <laughs> that's amazing you're gonna have a great time i know i will mm-hmm. i know i will oh i can't wait and my parents are gonna love that too oh my gosh they mm-hmm. they're gonna love grandchildren I wonder if the night, yeah, night holidays will look a bit different. Sure. In a couple of years, probably, if, sure. if your brother has a bunch of kids. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, I could see it. I'm excited for that, though. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. I think the holidays, holidays are fun for kids. You know, I, I always looked forward to holidays when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. So I think, hol- like, kids make holidays more fun. Yes. They inject energy into everything, you know? Kids make life fun definitely for me anyway definitely. like i told you i instantly transform into some kind of 11 year old boy you know <laughs> it's fantastic <laughs> like who can like oh it's just the best because i i'm the aunt you know and so i don't i i make the conscious decision to be like i'm not i'm not your disciplinarian i'm yeah. not i'm not doing that like if we go if mom tells you something and you and i look at each other like he, he, he <laughs> that's fine because i'm aunt melinda yeah, yeah. and it's just the best. So, yeah. Unless there are places that draw my lines, of course, because they're children. Of course. Adult, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But it's super, I see you twice a year and we're just going to be yeah, ridiculous sure. together. So, yeah. <laughs> so many dumb, made up games. And I was like that when I was a kid too, and I'm sure you were. Every kid is. You know, those aren't dumb. Those are being a kid. What were some of the games you played when you were a kid? Made up games. Oh, man. Not board games or something. Um, but like, oh, we had this fantasy that if you do this, then this happens, you know, man, I used to, I used to run around in the woods all the time. Mm-hmm. Like my, my house is on a nice patch of woods and I used to run around and pretend I was being like pursued by people and had to like, That's the best. yeah, I, I'm sure it's similar to like what you do with your nieces yes. and nephew. It's like, oh, you have these places you need to go. You have these people you need to capture or save yes. or whatever. You can't be seen by yeah, the, exactly. the, the enemy. Yeah. I used to do that kind of stuff all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Me and my sister used to, I swear we had a game called sisters and we would pretend we were sisters and it was like a legit thing. Do you want to play sisters? But I think the fun of the game is that we were adult sisters. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and we would have our apartments, which were Well, our you won the game because you're adult sisters now. <laughs> Dreams do come true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And we used to make like mountain soup and you just have a big pot and you put <laughs> like mountain rocks soup. and leaves <laughs> and you start all around. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like a thousand of them that are just like that. Like me and Brittany had this amazing game. Have you met my friend Brittany? 
Uh, Blonde, small. I don't think no, so. No, you'd remember from that from those descriptors. So we had this game that if you swim under the pool ladder and you come back up and you're in another dimension, but you have to make up the dimension as soon as you come up. So like you both swim under the pool ladder and you come up and then whoever says it first and then you have to like act out the dimension you're in. It was just great. It was a great <laughs> game. <laughs> but again, like there's no rules. There's no way to win. It's just a fantasy game. But And I could name like 12 of those that I used to love to play and that I still love to play with these people. My favorite one now is pretending the big toy at the park with my two nieces and the nephew is a giant ship. But the, it's, it's way more fun than it sounds. And every car that comes, you have to hide from. And then... Oh, I played that. Yeah. yeah. And then the ship is always sinking and there's always yeah. drama and panic. And I had a great time. It was really good. Highly recommend children. Yeah. There yeah, I I there was one time when there's this big stretch of open marsh between like my house and the nearest road and um past the road, past like another field is a, another big stretch of woods. And one time I went out with like my brother and my dad, we put on, you know, waterproof boots, we put on jackets and we like walked through the marsh and anytime a car came by, we like ducked down. And, it, yes. and we didn't even like talk about it before, you know, it just like started it's happening. It's just a game. You just yeah. like, you start doing and like it becomes very clearly accepted that you're like, oh, we're just walking through the marsh and we're not going to be seen by cars, <laughs> you know, yeah. you just like, and then you try to get across the road without like being seen by anyone. It's yeah. just like a thing that happens you know when so you're, fun when you're a kid mm -hmm. i love that kind of imagination you know yeah me too Lindsay sable was great for that she, she you know Lindsay, obviously but she uh we were so down for anything when we were kids oh we would build these obstacle courses in my backyard and go through them just for fun you know which is so weird but like there's a mud pit and then you have to jump over this thing and you have to do this thing we were very intense yeah simpler times simpler times <laughs> yeah for sure yeah but i really love my life you know i was very happy to come home and and yeah i'm grateful to be here i like it it's good yeah me too <laughs> good that's good is it true for like i know it's true but were you happy to come home here to new york yeah, I mean, I'm pretty adaptable. Oh, sorry, I didn't know that was your foot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was. Maybe oh, it was. never mind then. Um, yeah, I'm pretty adaptable. I mean, when I go home, like I went home for the holidays for like a week, I was really excited to go home. And then when I arrived back in New York, you know, I was excited to be here. So I think, I don't know. I try to... And I think I do a pretty good job of enjoying whatever circumstances I'm placed in. It's a gift that God yeah. gave you. It really yeah. is. You're just fine. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Steady as she goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a... And I, yeah, I, like you said, I love my life now. I'm, I'm blessed and mm -hmm. thankful every day that I have the life I do, you know? That's good. Mm -hmm. We should probably wrap it on up. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, well, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. I hope you've been challenged, interested, uplifted, hopefully all of the above. Um, and, you know, if, if there are certain things you want us to talk about or you have questions, comments, um, you can leave them right here in whatever forum you're listening to or you can reach out to us directly at trevorandmelinda at gmail.com. But thank you so much. We know there's a lot that you could be doing with your time and attention, which are very valuable commodities. Um, so thank you for spending them with us. Thank you. See you next time. See you next time.